Awesome. All right. Well, welcome everyone. It's August already, 2022, roaring 20s. Um, so if you're not here for Brisbane Azure User Group, now's your chance. <laughs> but if you are, well, welcome. So first of all, big thank you out there to our sponsors. So without these guys, we couldn't do this. So Codify, they provide awesome services. So if you need somebody to help you out with Azure, they're awesome. And Microsoft, pretty clear, they're awesome too. Otherwise, we would not be here. So <laughs> that's pretty easy. And I'm from Codify here today. No. Hello. Owen here today. Last last meetup, we had Codify come in. Uh, not today. Um, but they're great. They are fantastic. So getting involved. Um, we really need people to put their hand up, get involved, say a few few things. It doesn't have to be about an amazing success, although that's probably better, but it's really about how did you experience Azure? Was it a great experience? What were the learning opportunities? What things were great? What things were not as good? Um, it doesn't have to be a topic talk. It can just be whatever you guys want. It's really about sharing as this user group. So. Um, we've got a few sessions lined up, but um, we're keen to hear from everyone. And if you're keen to give a smaller talk, not a full, you know, hour or so talk, well, December, we not, if we get enough people in December, we can put a bunch of people together and do an unconvention night. So that's really cool, and we hope to do that in December. So that's always a good one. Uh, if you have something, get in touch with us. So email's there, let us know. We're keen for you, we're keen to hear from whatever you want to say. Uh, a few job opportunities, I'm going to throw this over to Dan. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, we are, if you're looking for a new adventure, we're certainly, and you have skills in any of those areas, uh, we're very, very interested in hearing, hearing from you, especially in the integration space. We've got a lot of work uh, in that area, some really exciting uh, clients and jobs. So yeah, we'd be happy to hear from you. You can either scan that barcode, Catch that email address if you can remember it, or you can just uh, come see me. Uh, fine. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. All right. So there was a bunch of updates this month. I'm I'm not covering everything. So for all those people who are going, but you didn't cover this, it's because I didn't want it. I'm sorry. Um, there's a few things that that look pretty cool that I that I'm calling out. So uh, who doesn't like faster hard drives? So you know, clearly that's number one. Um, so we've got a new Azure Premium SSD V2. Uh, you can see that one there in the middle. Uh, it's pretty cool if you're after something a little bit faster with a few more IOPS. Um, gateway load balancer. So if you've got gateway, if you've got load balancers or anything in in your stack at the moment, and you want to get uh, some additional security capabilities plugged in. Well, this here allows you to plug in those additional security capabilities without changing your endpoints. So it's a, it's a lot easier to plug in. Um, you can see the traffic there routes from your load balancer off to the, the gateway load balancer and then routes back. So it's a pretty easy sort of configuration. It allows you to do a few things like, you know, IPs and um, DDoS protect, protection if you're not already got that, if you're not already using uh, I'm just going to jump in here and say, try and go for front door first before you go for this sort of stuff. But if you don't have that sort of, if you don't have front door, maybe this is an option for you. Um, most of the time it's for web sites. Just go front door, it's easier. <clears throat> um, this was pretty cool here. So if you wanted to check out IoT Central, uh, there's now a guided experience and you can hook up your phone to IoT Central and use your phone as an IoT device. And you can start getting telemetry from your phone up through into your IoT Central. If you're interested in how IoT Central works, um, maybe this is something for you to check out. It's pretty cool. Uh, a few VMs that dropped. Um, so we've got some VMs with video cards. You can split and share if you've got lots of users with small graphics requirements. Or you can have multiple uh, video cards onto single machines if, if that's kind of what you want with the NVAD A10 V5. Um, the Azure Confidential gives you a bit of a, 
a more secure and robust. I think I think AMD is kind of winning at the moment with their confidential compute capability. If you're looking at VMs in Azure, so that gives you a, a better isolation between the VMs. Um, that allows you to be more secure. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, so Azure Monitor uh, dynamic thresholds. So I don't know. I've experienced this in the past where a lot of your monitoring tools, it, it's kind of like, you know, we get the high water and the low water and we get no real differentiation of the noise in between. Well, this one here is using a bit of AI to figure out, well, at different times, we've got different thresholds and we've got different patterns and, and it can actually pick up a few more things that you might want to hone in on where those high water marks in the past, they just completely, you know, smashed you to the point where too much noise, not really getting that information you need to actually resolve some of the real issues because those high waters might have had, you know, that time of the month we've got a lot of load. Um, that happens a lot actually. Um, and it doesn't actually allow you to focus in on some of those important parts. So that one's pretty cool, those dynamic thresholds. Check that out. So using machine learning. Then I'll just bundle up a few things here that that were of interest. So .NET 7. You know, if you know me, you know I love .NET. .NET's awesome, and Blazor's awesome. Sorry, I had to get that in there. Um, but .NET 7 is now supported in Azure Functions, so that's pretty cool if you're trying to get onto that bleeding edge. Um, so they've got a new isolated process mode on Azure Functions, which allows you to have a bit more control over what you're putting into Functions. Uh, PowerShell 7.2 support in Functions. We've got uh, in preview, so not GA, we've got TLS 1.3 for application gateway, so that's always good to have that being more secure. Now, this one here, for all those people who have on-premise web applications, I'm sure you know who you are. If you have to deal with security certificates, first of all, I'm sorry for you. That's a terrible experience. You should not be doing that. You should be using Azure. But if you are on-prem and you haven't got to Azure PaaS services yet, quite often security, so SSL certs and managing SSL certs is not fun. Most of the times your websites just kind of go offline in production. Customers don't like that. That's not great. This thing here allows, there's a new uh, health check that can actually proactively look at your certs and give you warnings about, hey, this thing's going to expire. Maybe you should get a new one. Um, so that's pretty handy. Uh, I know a lot of companies that that would be really handy for. So a few resources. So we've got a Slack channel. We've got a YouTube channel. We've got a few training sites here that are pretty cool. A few blogs that I like um, that are pretty cool. And tonight, without any further ado, let me introduce Dan. <laughs> I'm sure everyone knows Dan. So we're going to go through a session about uh, data mapping. And and I'm going to apologize to Dan straight away because with all of his certificates and, and everything, I couldn't actually fit them on the page. So I had to massively like shrink them down and only put the letters. It's, yeah. <laughs> so over to Dan. Thank you. Uh, so first of all, thanks everybody for coming uh, to these meetups. Uh, it's only been a couple of months now that we've started up the live meetings again, so it's really good to actually see real faces instead of having to stare at everybody through a computer. So, so thanks for coming. Um, as Damien said tonight, I'm going to be talking about uh, data mapping in the Microsoft Cloud, and uh, basically, I'm a I'm what you would call an integration architect. Uh, so that my real title at Deloitte is Specialist Senior Lead. Nobody knows what that means outside of Deloitte, so I should say I'm a Senior Integration Architect. Um, and for that reason, I'm interested in all things integration, especially on the Microsoft stack. Uh, so that's what I do. Um, lots of other boring information in there. Uh, just about the picture. Um, before I, I moved to Australia and changed careers to IT, I was actually a professional musician. Not a pianist, even though it looks like that. Uh, I was actually a trombone player. Uh, but I do play piano as well, and that's about the only thing I do musically now. I play in my church because they're the only place that will put up with my, my poor town. So <laughs> here we go. Something more interesting to me than all that other stuff. 
Okay, so why transformation? How many here work with integration at all or involved in integration? So, okay, a couple of people. So you guys, I don't need to explain to you why transformation. Data transformation is so important. It's an integral part of the integration. And the reason being that it's very rare that you have different systems or different applications speaking the same language, right? Um, you know, one of the most basic differences will be the, the, the structure and the way they represent data. For example, in one system, you know, a name might be first name and last name, and then in another system, it might all be in one field, just name, right? And address, think about address, how many different ways there are to represent an address. So when you're transferring messages between one system and another, which is at the heart of integration, uh, you often have to perform this kind of transformation and magic to make it, you know, uh, make it palatable to the system that you're sending that information to. And data structure is probably the most basic and common uh, problem that you need to solve with that. But there's other things too. Uh, for example, different systems might carry different identifiers, like have different primary keys to represent a, a record, like a customer will have an ID in one system and a different ID in another. And that means that if you're going to marry those things up, uh, you're going to have to have some sort of a cross-referencing kind of solution to be able to map those, those IDs to each other. Um, and then there's reference data. And by reference data, I mean uh, a set, a finite set of values that represent an, uh, an attribute of, a certain, of an entity. Uh, probably the most common and obvious one would be gender, for example, right? So, there's a very finite uh, set of values. It's been growing quite a bit over the years, but um, but there is you know a set of values, usually like male and female and unknown or something. But but different systems will have slightly different sets of terminology for that. So you need to be able to translate that reference data as well. But another aspect too about transformation is that um, for those of us who are really involved in integration. And, um, and know about all the different integration patterns and have been reading books by people like Gregory Hopp, um, who's defined all these enterprise integration patterns. Several of them are actually uh, accomplished through the transformation process itself. For example, content enrichment is a pattern. That's where the message that comes in doesn't have all the data and you've got to go and find some source, some other data as, as well to kind of augment that original message before you send it to the, to the target system or content filtering where there's too much information and you need to weed out stuff that the target is either not interested in or is not entitled to see. Uh, aggregator, of course, is about taking messages from different sources or different different messages together and combining them to make a, you know, a combined message. Uh, and splitting is about almost the opposite way where you're, you're actually breaking up a message into pieces and maybe sending it out differently or sending it out in batches. And then there's envelope uh, wrapping and unwrapping too. Probably the most obvious example I can think of that is soap messages, right? For those who still have to deal with soap. Um, but also in EDI, very common that a lot of messages in EDI are batched up and then you need to split them out uh, when, you're, when you're processing them. So there's a lot of reasons why transformation is a very, very important part of integration. And if you're going to work with any integration platform, you need to be confident that that capability is there. So if Microsoft Azure is going to be your integration platform, well, this, um, <clears throat> this, this diagram here, or this set of six services, they are all discrete services in Azure. They're all part of the toolbox, but Microsoft decided to apply a label to these six and call them Azure integration services. And it was ma mainly a marketing campaign to compete with them, companies like MuleSoft, you know, who say, try to make Azure look so complex and say, look, we'll just give you one product that gives you everything. For integration well i mean you have everything in azure it's just it's like picking the right tool right so they they pulled these six services together and said this is our azure integration services right now here's uh here's one reason why i, I love live meetings like this because i can get some audience interaction at this point i put out a question to everybody and, and i'm going to put the question to you and the answer will be you can raise your hand uh for it um the question is of these six services, how many of them actually support data transformation? And when I say data transformation, I mean actually changing the message, the structure of the message. Um, I'll give you a hint. It's more than one. So saying that, 
show of hands, how many think that it's two or more services in out of these six? OK, good. Uh, so since I've already said that it's more than one, everybody should have put their hand up. <laughs> All right, so hands again. How many? Three or more? Three or more. All right, keep your hand up if you think it's four or more. Only a couple. All right, five or more? Yeah. One, six, all six. Well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by uh, transformation. Okay. You can technically right. change the payload. So well, that's what I'm really talking about now, to be clear, about changing the payload, right? Oh. Okay, so there was only a couple of people who went all six. So it was kind of a trick question because you probably thought that would be making all this uh, drama about it, that it must be all six, but it isn't. Uh, the real answer is it's actually four. And the reason I'm kind of making a point about this, because the reason that I'm excluding event grid and service bus is the whole premise of those systems and how they operate is they don't change the message. The message that goes through is immutable. Uh, now, the properties and the metadata that travel with that message might change, but not the actual payload itself. But all four of the other ones uh, actually do uh, support data transformation. And the rest of this presentation, you know, my clicker doesn't work anymore. The rest of this presentation is going to be all about how those four services can cover six different scenarios that I'm going to talk about with data transformation. Uh, now, there were probably many more scenarios as well, but I've just, you know, for the sake of containment, kept it to six for this, for this presentation. All right, so the first one I want to cover is, uh, is BizTalk Maps. So how many here um, have worked with BizTalk before? A couple of people. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> actually, I really shouldn't say that. Biz, BizTalk is actually Microsoft's premier product uh, server based integration platform, and it is actually a very, very powerful platform. The problem with it is that it's server based, so it doesn't really fit our modern technology, right, for scalability and, and stuff like that. But companies, big companies, a lot of big companies, have invested a lot of money in their BizTalk solutions to handle their, their integration. And now, when they want to become modernized and migrate to the cloud, they have to deal with how, how are they going to do that? How are they going to migrate their solutions? And one of the investments that they make, of course, is in transformation. <clears throat> and whatever you think about BizTalk, uh, the one thing you have to say is that the mapper tool that they included in, in it was actually very intuitive. It's actually a, a really nifty, it's one of the better tools I've ever seen for actually doing it. I mean, you can't get much simpler than having a, a source schema on the left and a, you know, and a nice hierarchical structure and the target schema on the right and being able to just draw lines and connect things. If you're not familiar with BizTalk and you're wondering what those little colored squares are, they're called functoids. And no, that's not something you need to go to a chemist or a doctor to be <laughs> treated. Um, they're just little pieces of coded functionality that help you with the transformation. They do things like string manipulation or date manipulation or calculations or stuff like that, just to kind of assist uh, in that transformation. And there's a whole heap of them in this doc. There's 80 of them uh, that come out of the box. Plus, you can write your own. Uh, you can script. There's one that's a scripting functoid where you can put almost anything in there. So there's, um, so they're quite powerful. Now this map um, mapper tool lives in Visual Studio, and unfortunately, uh, no one has has actually created a Visual Studio Code extension for it that would run it. So if you're kind of to use it, you've got to use full-blown Visual Studio with the BizTalk SDK installed. And when you create one of these maps, what happens is when you compile it it actually produces XSLT. And for those of you who work with XML, they know that XSLT is the style sheet transformation language. That's how you, that's how you uh, do transformations using XML. So a cool thing about the mapper is that it's kind of self-documenting. I mean, you can look at that map and you can see exactly what it's doing. Uh, it doesn't take, it's not hard to figure out how the transformation is happening for the most part. It doesn't help too much when you get into maps like this. <laughs> Um, I, I have to I have to confess that's not an, a real map. I actually created that for for example, but a long time ago. Uh, but I've had had some that have been that that have been almost as bad as that. And when you start dealing with really large schemas in EDI, that's one of the drawbacks about this kind of uh, this kind of transformation process. But anyway, um, 
the thing about uh, moving to the cloud is that there, there's basically four types of major artifact types in this talk. Schemas, maps, pipelines, and orchestrations. Which one do you think is the easiest to migrate to Azure? Anyone want to take a guess? No one? Okay, it would be the schemas. Obviously, the schemas don't change. An XML schema is the same no matter where you host it. Uh, the second easiest thing might be your maps. Um, and the reason is, is because Logic Apps has given you the ability to host your BizTalk maps in Azure. Um, now, actually, what it really hosts is the XSLT that you generate from those maps. Um, and that's, uh, and, and that, that's what you can actually upload because that's all the map does. This is a tool for generating XSLT. So if you want to migrate your BizTalk map, in Visual Studio, you right click the map and you click validate map. The validate map actually runs the compiler and makes sure that it can actually compose the XSLT from it, that the map is, is valid. And then it gives you uh, a link to that XSLT file, which is then what you actually upload uh, to Azure to use with your logic apps. Now, the next step depends on what kind of logic app you're using. Most of you will probably know if you know about logic apps, there's two kinds now. You have your, your traditional consumption based ones and you've got your standard logic apps. If you're using the consumption based logic app, then you need an integration account. That integration account is basically a container for you to host your, your schemas, your maps, uh, when you're doing EDI, you know, your agreements and, and, um, and partner profiles and a few, few things like that. So you need to upload that uh, to your integration account and then in your logic app, you link that integration account to the logic app and then you can access those maps from within, within the shape. And I'll, I'll show you a demo of that very, very shortly. If you're using standard logic apps, it's a little bit easier because you don't need an integration account. In fact, integration accounts don't even work with, with standard logic apps. Instead, standard logic apps actually give you a place to actually host those, those schemas and maps in the, in the logic app itself, and or in the portal anyway. You can just upload it there. So you might say, well, that makes um, standard very appealing in this case because it's easier to use. Well, in, in that aspect, yes, that's true. However, um, there is one drawback. Uh, standard logic apps uh, run on .NET Core. The integration account for consumption logic apps uses the .NET framework. Those functoids that I talked about before, they require the .NET framework. So if you use standard, that means pretty much uh, none of your functoids are probably going to work out of the box. Now there are workarounds for it, but out of the box, you're gonna you're gonna have to do some work, right? They're not going to they're not going to run. Whereas with the integration accounts, most of them will. There are a couple of uh, exceptions there. Um, if you use a custom or a scripting functoid that references external assemblies, which is something that you can do very easily with a server-based product, um, uh, that doesn't work easily with an integration account in Azure. Again, there's workarounds for it, but you're going to have to do a little bit of tweaking there. It just won't work out of the box. And the same thing with the database functoids. So it's worth mentioning integration accounts. They're they're not actually they're not cheap, really. Um, so if you go with a basic plan, you're going to be spending about 300 US dollars a month uh, for that. And that will probably, if it's all you're doing is hosting schemas and maps, that's that's probably fine. You have a limit of 500 uh, of each of those in there. Um, if you're just doing EDI, though, then you probably, you really kind of have to move towards a standard and that gives up pricey with about $1,000 a month for those. There is a free integration account, but it's not meant to be used in production. There's no SLAs around it. You're only allowed one in an Azure uh, subscription, uh, and it, do, it does allow you to host 25 maps though, but it's good for a development environment or a lower environment. And that uh, QR code will take you to more information about that integration accounts. Uh, so with that, I kind of want to show you a demo uh, of this working. Now for this demo, I'm going to be using this BizTalk map, which is the age old um, example of turning a purchase order into an invoice. And uh, pretty easy to see what's going on, but I'm going to talk through it, it. I like this map because it goes through some of the basic kind of transformation features that we normally have. So first is content filtering. 
so we, on an invoice, we care more about who we're billing than we are who we're shipping to. So we're gonna we're gonna eliminate the ship to uh, information in Target. Uh, we're also going to do a little bit of data structure changing. So it's it's hard to see on this image because uh, BizTalk, everything that you link, it's this little chain link icon on it, and it kind of covers it up. But some of the um, some of the at attributes in the purchase order turn into elements in the target schema, and also the names are changing, as you can see. <clears throat> uh, we're also going to do a little bit of concatenation using a string concat functoid. So we're going to uh, combine first name and last name into a single field. We're going to do a bit of date manipulation. That first blue functoid uh, puts outputs the current date, which we're going to set as the order date. And then the, the next one actually adds 14 days to it for the bill, the invoice due date, right? Um, and then we're also going to do some computation. So for each item on this purchase order, uh, we're going to multiply the quantity and the price, and then we're going to do a cumulative sum of all of that to output the total price for the, for the invoice. And all of this is really easy to do with a BizTalk map, as you can see. It's very, very, very straight ahead. And here's my example input file. So I've got uh, an XML file here uh, that's that's basically a purchase order. And I'm going to run it through the map, and it should turn into an invoice that looks like that. So let's go and do our demo. OK, so what I want to point out here is that this is, this is, by the way, the XSLT generated from the BizTalk map. And you can see there's a bunch of declarations in here for a user C Sharp namespace, which actually points to a bunch of C Sharp script. So all of those functoids in a BizTalk map are implemented using C Sharp script that's embedded into the XSLT. Even simple things like just the, you know, the, the current date or doing a simple string concatenation, uh, they do it using C Sharp. This is why it needs to see the .NET framework to run and why you need consumption uh, based logic apps to do that. So now that we have our XSLT, we need to upload it to an integration account in Azure, and you can see I've already done that, um, but I'll just show you the process of how I would do it. You click add, uh, you point to your, uh, you give it a name, you point to your file. So we'll just choose the version one file uh, that I have. And then very important is that you choose the map type. So in this dropdown, you'll see you've got different versions of XSLT uh, as well as Liquid. Now, all the XSLT produced by a BizTalk map is always version 1.0. Oh, so you have to make sure you choose um, choose that one. That's important. OK, uh, so now that we've got our, our uh, XSLT uploaded, I can look at it if I want to. It's read only, but you can actually see what you've uploaded if you want to confirm it. Now let's go into our logic app. And in this logic app, you can see that uh, we need to link the integration account to it using the workflow settings. So there you, you choose it from your dropdown. If your integration account doesn't appear in that dropdown, it means it's not either not in the same region or in the same subscription as your logic app. That's a, that's a requirement. So now that we've linked the integration account, if we go into the logic app itself, you can see we're using a transform XML shape. And if you click in there, you, your content is the body of the message coming in. And you've got this little map dropdown, which will highlight all the XSLT maps that you've uploaded in your integration account. So we choose the one that we want. And uh, we save that, and we're ready to now run and test this logic app, which I'm going to do in Postman. So here's my input XML file, the one that I showed you on the slide uh, before. And this is configured to call my logic app. So when I run it, hopefully we'll get an invoice out of that. OK, now let's see if all the functoids worked correctly. The first one is the payment due date which we can see is correctly calculated 14 days after the invoice date. So that, that, that one worked. The string concatenation worked. Uh, so it's got my name in one field, which is good. And let's see if it calculated the total price for all of the items. So it's come out with a total price of 1360. If we look at each of these items, we'll see that we've got one for 1,000, two for 30, and three for 100. And I believe that amounts to 1360. So. So without making any changes at all to BizTalk map, I was able to uh, take that XSLT, upload it to Azure, and it just worked out of the box. Perfect sunny day scenario. It's not always like that, uh, but this is, a, this is definitely a, a one way it can work. OK, so considerations for this method. Uh, obviously, 
it's helpful when you're using BizTalk Maps and you're wanting to migrate your BizTalk solution to the cloud. Uh, this is a perfect scenario for it. Uh, remember that we're working in XML land here, right? Every, everything with BizTalk, by the way, is XML. Um, no matter how you get the data in or out of BizTalk, whatever it is, it gets converted to XML in the engine. So uh, some things to be aware of, as I mentioned before, uh, the XSLT that's generated is only ever version 1.0 of XSLT. It's actually not so much a mapper limitation as it is the .NET framework uh, that had that limitation, so, which is what the mapper relies on. So uh, some functoids are not going to be supported out of the box, and it's just something to be aware of. And you'll need to debug your map separately before, because it's kind of hard to do that within the context of a logic app to see what, what goes wrong, but you would normally have done that anyway. Do you okay. need a, a BizTalk license to use the BizTalk SDK? I'm glad you asked that. Um, so uh, <clears throat> if you want to just use the mapper, uh, technically all you really need is a, a Visual Studio and an MSDN license that allows you to download the, the developer edition of BizTalk. And you don't even have to install BizTalk totally. You just have to install the, the developer SDK on your machine to get the add-ins to Visual Studio. And then you, you, you can use that to generate the maps. So, yeah. okay. So, uh, if you want to learn more about BizTalk Maps, there's this great book out there by by Sandro Pereira, uh, and uh, or it, it, it it's designed for BizTalk Maps, but it also talks a lot about XSLT. So, if you want to um, uh, want to refer to it for that reason, you can. And then, uh, if you're really interested in learning more about the functoids. Some poor soul out there spent way too many hours in his life uh, writing a course where he goes through every single one of the 80 functoids in detail and shows you how to use them. So if you're ever lying awake at night wondering, what do I use a cross-reference functoid for? Well, there you go. That's your answer. And then you should definitely go see a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So method number two is logic ads, but this time instead of a BizTalk map, we're just doing XSLT. Now you're probably sitting there saying, wait a minute, didn't, isn't that what you just showed me? Because the BizTalk map is we actually just upload the XSLT. And that's absolutely true. It's just in this case, the XSLT may not have come from a BizTalk map. And why is that significant? It's because the Logic Apps do support XSLT 2.0 and 3.0. So that gives you uh, some added features. There's a big difference in terms of the number of built-in functions that come with XSLT 2.0 or 3.0. And that can help you solve a problem with some of those functoids. So, for example, if you're if the .NET framework is causing you issues in your logic app, you can potentially rewrite a lot of those functoids using uh, access built in XSLT functions. And that's exactly what I'm doing in this demo. So uh, what I've done is I've replaced uh, some of those uh, all of the <coughs> functoids actually with XSLT functions. So we'll go through this demo and I'll kind of show you. This is the new XSLT, uh, which you can see the first thing is that I'm highlighting it's version 3.0. So I've indicated that. That tells the compiler that, yep, we're using version 3. You'll notice that there's no longer these declarations, so these use the C sharp namespaces, because all of this C sharp script has been removed. And I've gone and replaced it with, um, with XSLT. So see, that was the old one that had all those declarations. That's all gone now. So how, do, how am I using the, the functions? Uh, I've got here the, the date. This is I'm, I'm adding 14 days using a, by adding a date time duration uh, in there. Again, built in uh, to XSLT 2.0, I think. Um, <coughs> I'm concatenating the first name and the last name with a simple concat function. Uh, and even calculating that, that aggregated total price, I can do it in one line of XSLT, which is actually quite powerful. So let's see if it works. So obviously I need to upload this new XSLT file and you'll notice that I've chosen XSLT 3.0 as the type. It's important that I do that to, to indicate to the compiler, yeah, this you need to compile it with that. Um, and now, uh, and of course you can look at it if you want uh, online, the same as before. So now if we go back to our logic app, the same logic app we had before, <clears throat> we're gonna make a small modification. I'm gonna go into the transform XML and I'm gonna change the map to the new map that I've uploaded, the one that says version three. And we'll save that and we'll now rerun the scenario and see if I get the same output. So going back into Postman, 
Uh, again, there's there's the message I got the last time. Uh, the response is still sitting there, so we're just going to rerun it again because we've given the logic app enough time to recompile, uh, and we'll hopefully get something similar back. Okay, looks like we did, but let's see if all those uh, functions work. So again, we look at the payment due date. It is 14 days later. Excellent. It's done the string concatenation. Fine and it has correctly calculated the total price of 1360. So everything works. So I was able to remove all the functoids and replace it with XSLT functions and the map uh, still works. Okay, so what is this good for? Uh, it's good when you need features in 2.0 or 3.0 of XSLT, uh, or you don't have this talk <laughs> if you want to, uh, to generate maps for you. Uh, all the other things are the same. Now, one of the key drivers for doing this is that Logic App Standard couldn't deal with the functoids very well. So this would be a perfect opportunity to deal with it. <clears throat> Except uh, Logic App Standard does not support XSLT 2.0 or 3.0 in generally available yet, but it is in, pre in preview now, on uh, private preview, I think. And if you scan that QR code, you'll actually get to um, a GitHub uh, repo that has a list of all of the the different um, logic app connectors and and the and the roadmap for them. So it's listed. So so it is coming. So very soon I expect that to be GA. Okay. Now both of those first two, two scenarios were confined to working with XML, uh, but you know that all the cool kids now use JSON, right? So uh, they're not biz talk maps aren't going to help you with that. So if you're dealing with JSON, then the answer uh, in this case is or one answer anyway is um, is to use liquid. So how many people know what liquid is? Besides beer. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so liquid uh, is a templating language. And when I say templates, you can actually think of like Microsoft Word templates. You know, when you do mail, mail merges, right? You've got fields that are, you know, placeholders that have get dynamic data into, inserted into them. It's the same concept. Uh, you create a template and you put these tags in it uh, that can take input data. It also supports uh, some programming constructs, like um, it can do looping, it can do conditional logic, you can declare variables, and there's some built-in functions that you can use as well. Now, the cool thing about Liquid is that it's just, it works with any text. So it can work with XML, with JSON, with CSV. It's very commonly used in web pages, actually, as a way to, to output um, HTML using dynamic data uh, that's fed into it. So in that sense, you can create a template for doing a transformation using Liquid, which is exactly what this does. So Logic Apps gives you support for that. Uh, there's actually four different shapes that you can use depending on what you're transferring from what to what, right? So you can do JSON to JSON, JSON to text, XML to JSON, uh, or XML to text. So you can see how useful uh, that would be. Um, now, there are different kinds of uh, uh, flavors of liquid out there, right? Think of how many different beers you know. So, um, so liquid, I think there's the original one was Shopify, I think, which is probably built on Ruby, I think. Um, but there's also Jekyll, and there's also Dot Liquid, which is what Microsoft chose to work with. Uh, and of course, then there's also different versions as well. So, Logic Apps currently uses Dot Liquid version 2.0. But there is already dot liquid has progressed to like 2.2. So why am I mentioning that? Because they all behave a little bit differently. So you got to be aware of that uh, because you can run in, you can get into trouble if you presume that a liquid template that you tested in one version of liquid isn't necessarily going to work the same uh, when you go to the other another version of it. So uh, for this demo. Uh, I've now uh, re-imaged my purchase order as a JSON file. It's the same same thing structure. It's just that it's in JSON now, and I'm going to execute this liquid template, which is going to turn into that uh, that invoice. And first thing you should see right right away is that uh, the liquid templates looks a lot simpler than XSLT. Right? It's uh, it's actually much more intuitive to use. Now I could uh, use this to highlight it, but I think. What I'll do is I'll actually just show it to you. Um, I'll show it to you live. So, uh, <coughs> yes. 
Thanks. All right. So looking at this, um, this liquid, the first thing um, that I'm doing here is I'm declaring a variable, which is a place just to hold uh, a value. Right now I've set the zero, but you can tell that it's going to be, be accumulating the total price, right? Um, then I'm uh, using some filters. That's what we call them in, in, um, in liquid to execute some built-in functions. So here I'm using the date function to output the date. Uh, using date time now, basically. And then here, uh, for the payment due date, I'm adding a value to it. And that integer, that very large inter integer, represents the number of seconds in 14 days. So I'm simply adding 14 days to the current, um, current date time now. Uh, you can see that I'm doing the string concatenation here with an append function. And then uh, over here in the items, what I'm doing is I'm... Um, basically using a value, uh, a variable rather, to capture the product of the quantity and the total price, and keeping a running total of that, which then is output as the total price. So this template should do the same functionality that we were doing before using, you know, XSLT functions or functoids before. Okay, so this is my, my logic app, and for this one, I'm actually using a logic app standard one, so I can show you the difference. In here, you'll see I've got a place to upload my schemas and my maps. So in the maps, I have uh, I have my liquid template uploaded, um, uploaded there. That's the one I was just showing you. And in the logic app itself, workflows, JSON to JSON liquid, um, and go into designer. I've got, you'll see one thing right away that Logic App Standard has a much slicker designer. It, um, I've got a transform JSON to JSON. So again, the incoming request is going to be my JSON. The name will be, this drop down will show all of the liquid templates that I have uploaded to that Logic App, and there's only one, so that's the one I've chosen. So this should, should execute properly. Okay, so what I have, I've got my JSON uh, purchase order here. That I showed you before, and I'm pointing to my logic app, and when I go and execute that, I get my uh, my invoice back straight away. Now let's see if all the functions worked. First thing is that the payment due date <coughs> should be 14 days after the order date. Hmm. That didn't work very well, did it? Okay, let's come back to that. Uh, bill to the name uh, field is concatenated, so that worked okay. Uh, and then for calculating the total price, look at that, 1360. That worked perfectly, all right? So what happened here? Okay, well, I want you to look at this number very carefully. When I, um, as I execute this again, I want you to see how the number changes. Notice that it's only the first two digits that change, okay? So this is what's actually going on, and this is that caveat I warned you about. This function that I have here, in uh, Shopify or uh, Liquid, that, that little uh, percent %s is supposed to return the number of seconds since 1970, right? It's supposed to, it's supposed to it actually represents it as a number of seconds at which then I add uh, this value, right? Or actually, no, I'm sorry. It takes the, the date time that's passed into it, which is the current date, represents it as the number of seconds, adds that value to it, and then outputs it, right? Now that actually works. I used a, a liquid online tester bed and it works fine, but that tester bed was using Jekyll, not the same as dot liquid. What that percent yes, actually means in dot liquid is the number of seconds past the current minute. Okay. And then if that's not bad enough, it, it treats that as a string, not as a number. So the plus then says, oh, you've got a string that you're plusing to something else. You must want me to concatenate it. So that's why the first two numbers kept changing and the rest of it. Yeah, that's what it was doing. So these are the things you have to watch out for, right? Uh, the version of liquid. Uh, but other, other than that, you know, it, it worked fine. So as long as you're testing properly and testing with the right version, you know, you can hopefully get around these issues. Any questions about that? How do you transform the, the payment due date from the... Or take liquid. Oh, how you know how to yeah, solve this? Yeah. yeah, I couldn't find a way to do it. <laughs> I couldn't find a way to do it. Yeah, <laughs> gave up after a while. So, is there kind of like a, a visual designer for the liquid templates, or is it all code? That's a good question. If there is, I, I don't know what it is because I don't work with liquid that often, honestly. But that would be something to 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 check out. Yeah. 
something similar to what you can do like this talk, like right? Yeah. Uh, well, there is something I can tell you about later um, that might give us some hope there. OK, so some considerations when you're working with Jason, uh, liquid is very a very possible solution that you can use. If, you're, if your transformation is relatively simple, like obviously there's a limitation of what you can do uh, with just a simple templating language, uh, but you know it can solve a lot of pro basic problems for you, especially if you're using the right version uh, of liquid. So that's, those are the things you need to watch out for. OK, so all three of those uh, scenarios I've shown you before have their, have their issues or their constraints, right? So it's possible that none of those things will actually work for your scenario. I can pretty much guarantee this method will work. And that's simply getting and coding it yourself right? <laughs> in an Azure function. So the great thing about Azure function is you are in control of everything. You're in control of your uh, development environment, you, the language that you use. You can choose to use Liquid. You can choose to use XSLT and you can use whatever version suits you because you get to choose that, right? your libraries um, or you can just write straight code to do it and if you're working in C sharp uh, one library I can suggest for you is AutoMapper. how many people here have used AutoMapper before yeah, but you have right yeah a couple of people people either love or hate this um, but one thing about AutoMapper is it does make a little bit simpler um, my demo is actually going to show AutoMapper. so so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you doing the same conversion using uh, using auto mapper. So OK, uh, this is a C sharp function, an Azure function that I've created. You can see that I've imported the auto mapper library and I'm basically creating uh, this map by declaring a mapper configuration and it's fairly intuitive because I'm changing a purchase order to an invoice. And then you can see the, the kind of syntax that you use is for each field you say for member, your destination and your source. And uh, your source, sorry, your source going to your destination, rather. Uh, yeah, that's the source comes second. Um, now, the cool thing about AutoMapper is that if your source and target field have this has the same name, you don't even you don't actually have to include it in there. It, it's smart enough to work out that that's how it's going to map. You don't have to explicitly tell it that. But you can you, you do need to if the name changes or if you want to do something fancy like execute a function. Uh, like, you know, date time now, uh, or in this case, I'm actually calling out to a, a custom function that I've created to do to calculate total price. Um, and of course, you have to declare any sub elements as well, sub objects within that, that schema. But that's it. It's pretty straight ahead code uh, to do what I want. Now, first, of course, I had to I have to deserialize my input files to, to, to C sharp objects. So I had to declare the classes uh, for all of that. So that's where the bulk of the code really is is defining those objects. But uh, with that, this should be able to do that transformation for me. So if I go in here, I think all I really need to write is func start. And this is going to spin up this Azure function locally on my machine, and it gives me a URL to call in that. So here's my input um, input JSON file that I'm, I'm sending to this, to this Azure function, which is now running <coughs> locally on my machine. And <laughs> very quick response, we got our um, our invoice out of that. And let's see if everything worked. So the order date is then. Uh, that payment due date is. Hmm. Yeah, invoice and order uh, data. Sorry, it's from the invoice date, right? It's calculated 14 days from the invoice date. That's what it's done. It's concatenated my name correctly, and it's uh, and it's correctly computed the 1360 for the for the total price. So. Uh, can't go wrong. Uh, well, you can go wrong, but then it's your fault when it goes wrong because you wrote the code badly. Right? <laughs> so, uh, so that's basically uh, a way to get around um, anything uh, with Azure Functions because you code it yourself. And a lot of developers really like working with functions anyway. They just like being in the code. They like how easy it is to write unit tests and do all of your release pipelines and stuff without. Uh, it just seems to be easier uh, to work. Okay. Method number five, API management. This was a, maybe a little bit of a surprise to some people that you can do data transformation with that. Uh, of course, API management is invaluable for being able to, to set up a, a facade and a governance structure and, and security and all that in front of your APIs. Um, but transformation, uh, one of the things that we, we often use API management for is to modernize interfaces. So if you've got old SOAP 
things that you want to expose as REST, you can actually put API management in front of it and it can give you that layer. So knowing that you can convert SOAP to, to REST and possibly JSON, it's probably not a surprise that, you, that API management gives you the ability to transform XML to JSON and vice versa. But it can actually also execute an XSLT template if you wanted to. Uh, it also has a find and replace string if you want, and this is in the payload of the message. Uh, for those of us uh, who work with BizTalk, one of the common things we often had to do in, in transformations was you'd have canonical schemas uh, in an organization, which weren't really canonical. Like all they really did is change the namespace, but the structure was the same. And yet you had to write a complex piece of script in a BizTalk map to change that namespace. I think you could probably solve that in API management with a simple find and replace string, right? Uh, you can actually replace the whole message body too. So API management does this using policies. That's how it, API management does everything is, is policies. And, and these are built-in policies that allow you to do that. You can use those policy in any section um, of your API uh, structure and in all scopes. So it's quite versatile. I'm not going to do a demo about that, but just be aware that uh, this, that's a possibility. And maybe one of the scenarios for that is if you want transformation to happen right at the front door, right? At, at the gateway level before you actually, and for say, for example, you want to start content filtering and make sure that certain data that shouldn't get into an organization gets, doesn't get there. So maybe that might be a scenario for this. Probably not suitable for really complex transformations, but uh, you can do probably pretty simple things there. And the last method I, I kind of have to talk about is Azure Data Factory. So Azure Data Factory is basically um, Azure's ETL tool, ETL being extract, transform, and, and load. So obviously no surprise that it can do transformations. Uh, Azure Data Factory basically you build a pipeline of, of executable shapes in there, and those shapes can do a bunch of different transformation functions, including all of these here, aggregate, conditional split, uh, filter, lookup, all of that stuff. And you can also determine the output column. So even if you're just moving data from one database to another, uh, but you might have to change a column name or something like that, you can do that very, very easily uh, using Data Factory. And, and you can set up all of these little, these pipelines with, with, with actions that are chained after each other. Um, if you want to have a play with Data Factory, you can scan that QR code and you'll get into this sort of quick start exercise. And it's kind of a good example of how a transformation happens because it starts with a, a movie database, a CSV list of you know all these movies over 30 or 40 years. Um, you perform a filter on that to filter it down to a certain span of years, like say 10 years. And then you can also then aggregate it all and output a listing of all the different genres and how many movies were in each genre. So that's what this exercise done. Very simple transformation. You use it obviously when you're using ETL or ELT uh, type of uh, scenarios and when you're performing data migrations. OK, so summing up, uh, I've kind of put everything all into this one table here uh, that you can look at um, and I will share these slides so you'll be able to see that if you want to use that as a reference point. I'm not going to talk through it all now because I already have, but I did want to uh, mention this as well. And somebody asked about the visual tool for JSON, uh, Liquid, right? Um, so Microsoft understanding how painful transformations can be, they're actually investing right now in actually creating uh, a data mapper, uh, a cloud hosted data mapper in, in Azure. It's not out yet. Um, it's something that they're working on, but if it's anything like, you know, you can see in these screen mockups here, it's probably going to be something like a BizTalk mapper, but it'll be able to handle modern stuff as well, like JSON, not just XML. So we can look forward to that. Uh, that coming eventually. It'll be supported in VS Code. It'll work in Logic Apps, and yeah, I think it will make lives a lot easier if they do it well. So, you can keep an eye out for that. Um, so uh, that's that's really my um, uh, my data mapper um, uh, presentation. But I thought I'd, I'd take a couple of extra minutes at the end to introduce you to something that might be kind of really handy to you. That's that's somewhat related. Uh, when we're doing transformations on a project uh, for the developer to be able to build those transformations, they have to understand, they have to have a specification to work with, right? And it can be very painful uh, to create those, right? Usually it's a spreadsheet, right? Where you have this source and target and all the lines going across. 
a colleague of mine um, created this tool called apimap.com. And this is free. You can go into a website uh, there. And it basically gives you the ability to rapidly create these maps, these schema maps. Now, it doesn't generate code yet, but it does generate the specification for you. And, um, and you can actually build your maps, you know, using a visual uh, tool. It's very similar to the BizTalk mapper in there, uh, which I think is, is, is pretty awesome. So um, I'll just give you a bit of a live demo of that. OK, so you basically create an account. It's free. Uh, I've already logged into that account, and you can see I've got some messages. So you can upload your schemas. It will handle JSON and XML for you, either one. And then you can create uh, maps from that. So if I open up one of my maps, uh, I think this is probably a good example. Um, I can go in and uh, view that map if I want. Um, that's one way to see it, but I can also generate uh, an image for it, a diagram, which then looks looks like that, and it's quite intuitive, right? So you can see that he's got um, he's got little icons to show what, what what kind of fields that they are, whether they're text or date, or or an object type, which is made up of other things. Uh, everything kind of maps across. If I click on any one of these fields, it'll give me a close up view of that field and everything connected to it. So it gives you that full route, which is kind of nice. Um, and one thing that this can do that I haven't seen any other mapper tool be able to do is let's say um, that you are using canonical schemas in an organization. Sometimes your maps go through a couple of different hops, right? Because you have a canonical schema in between. This can actually chain uh, maps together. So if I have an invoice that goes to a, sh a shipping notice, or actually maybe a purchase order that, that created that invoice and then to a shipping notice, if I add it to this map, it can actually see the full end-to-end -end and how it maps. Uh, so, but that was kind of a pretty nifty feature. Who's uh, transformations? Or is it just? It's actually documenting your transformations. It doesn't generate code, but it actually allows you to create you know, a diagram and a specification it. And you can export that as a, a C, as a CSV file, so that you can create the spreadsheet from that as well, which is really really handy uh, for your documentation. Uh, now, what I was trying to do is go into docs. Ah, yes, UI annotation. So um, you can actually in the documentation because <clears throat> at, when you create these these links, you can put a lot of metadata in there. You can actually uh, create screen mockups and, and and add those as well, uh, so that if you're you can make it absolutely clear. For example, if you're talking about a, a user interface, yeah, I mean this field uh, by that, you know, to show it. So it's kind of kind of well thought out, I think. So I thought I would just show that to you. So uh, if you want to uh, go to that website, that's fine. And this is the guy who who wrote it, Joseph Cooney. Um, so he hasn't worked on it for a couple of years now, but if you have a lot of interest in this tool and you ping him uh, with features that you want, you know, you might be able to inspire him to, to pick it up again and, and, and work with it. He did have some intentions to enhance this tool. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much wraps things up for me. The key takeaways, obviously data transformation is a very essential part of any integration platform. Uh, and Azure does give you plenty of tools and plenty of ways that you can achieve that. Um, so you can feel confident in, for having Azure using your uh, handle your integration solutions. And then apimap.com is just a tool that I've introduced to you to help with maybe with documenting some of those transformations. Uh, there's some references here uh, that you know might be helpful to you. Um, as I said, I'll, I will upload these slides so that you'll be able to access them. And that's about it. Are there any questions? Well done, Dan. <laughs>